professor of psychology at Atlantic Baptist University. And uh, I'd like to just talk a little bit about uh, the existential therapist and doing some screening for substance abuse. And the reason why I'm, I'm interested in this is, is research being done on uh, existential therapists in the UK came up with the fact that only 2% of therapists um, do any kind of psychometric screening, or ex existential therapists do any kind of uh, psychometric screening for issues of substance or, or whatnot. And so I realized that the existential perspective rails against the whole idea of categorizing or limiting an individual and emphasizes the professional thrust uh, towards being kind of a person-centered therapy, but there also needs to be some accountability. And the use of an objective psychometric test allows you to, to, to uh, kind of have that secondary perspective to your own. And it also helps to screen for those at-risk issues that might be influencing how a person is dealing with their existential issues of life because they all everything seems to connect together. Uh, I just want to give you a little bit of a picture of that. Uh, there was a man once that came to a, a large city, a businessman, and he saw the downtown core and all the big buildings, and he was so impressed by this that he decided that he was going to stay in the largest building in this downtown core. And he walked into the main floor bar, sat down beside a nice, well-dressed man. This man had a suit on, top hat, some glasses. And they struck up a conversation. And this fellow that was sitting at the bar, this well-dressed man in his suit, was telling the, new biz new, the newcomer to the city that there was a unique feature to this city, that all of the skyscrapers funneled the wind down the street to this particular building, and that there was such massive updrafts against this building that it was unique only to this place on the face of the earth. And the fellow said, no, oh, that's amazing. I'd like to see more about that. You know, tell me more. And he said, well, come with me, and I'll show you. So they went to the top of this building. And they're standing on the top of this massive skyscraper. And they're looking over, and this sharp, well-dressed man walked up to the edge and said, the updrafts against this building are so strong that I can step off the edge, and the wind will stop me from dying. And the newcomer said, oh, I don't believe that. Can't be true. It's true, he said. Watch. And he stepped off the edge to the horror of the newcomer. And this man started plummeting down, falling faster and faster. But at about 60 floors above the ground, he started to slow down. And at 40 floors above the ground, he stopped. And it was as if the wind picked him up and brought him to the top of the building, and he stepped off. And this newcomer said, whoa, that's amazing, let me try. And he jumped off the building and, whoo, flat, splatted all over the sidewalk. And the bartender on the main floor of that skyscraper looked out the window at the splattered body, and he said, that Clark Kent is mean when he's drunk. You see, even the ubermenches among us, the supermen, uh, I know it's a cheesy story, but it shows a little bit of how chemical use can influence any of us. No matter how strong our identity is, no matter how many skills or talents we have, chemicals will influence the way we think, the relationships we have, and the way that we relate with each other. And that is very important because I want you to just take a good look picture, a good look at, at this uh, picture here and get a sense of what is happening with that. You'll see that the wheels are moving, and yet you know that in objective reality they aren't.
And that's the essence of what our mind does. Our mind is us relating to ourselves within ourselves. And it is in that relating with ourselves, within ourselves, and us relating to things around us that we experience meaning. And so we need to be able to relate, we need to be able to create, we need to be able to communicate in order to have meaning. And so the existential psychotherapist is interested in how we relate to ourselves within ourselves, how we relate to our world. What kind of internal support structures are there for us to relate to our world? And what kind of external social support structures are there for us to relate to our world? Now, we can think of terms like suicidal ideation or depression or substance abuse, but there are other terms that are also important. Terms that are important to the meaning-making process. Terms like being mythically dispirited. That basically means that there's a lack of a strong guiding narrative, a lack of a social structure that helps to guide our narrative, our personal narrative. And then there is also the existential. The choices that we make, what the power that they have. Because every experience that we have is largely an internal one. It goes on within our own head. There's the objective phenomenological experience, for example, with the Necker cube here. We can have reality changing or the perception of the reality changing even though the reality itself does not change. We have this Necker cube here and in 10 seconds we can see that it's a bird's eye view, a wire box with a, from a bird's eye view, a wire box from a worm's eye view, it's a cube viewed from the left, it's a cube viewed from the right, and in 10 seconds you can come up with 10 different meanings to one objective reality. And so there is that mythopoeic aspect of us as well. Okay? The mythos being story and the poetic being the creating. We are always creating stories in every situation. And so the existential psychotherapist is also interested in how do we make those stories? What's the perspective of the stories? What's the support structure to those stories? There are lots of things that can influence this, but basically we're interested in what is the dynamic guiding narrative and what are the parts to that. Um, just going through very quickly, the SPSSI is a very relational test. It screens for, its screening is fairly interactive. It measures both projective and objective and its scoring is very simple. It, you know, it's a very cookbook type of setup for the scoring. And, and I just want to kind of walk through with you just to introduce you to this. Just want you to close your eyes for a moment. And I want you to imagine a room without any windows and only one door. This room can be any size that you wish. Now imagine within this room anything any one or any combination of things that you imagine that you need to be happy and content. I want you to picture how this room is set up. What does it look like? And what feeling do you get from this room? Have a good sense of how your room looks, how you feel in it, where you're standing in it. Now imagine that you're in this room standing near the door. The door is about to close and once it closes it can never be opened again. Imagine what your reaction will be to this. Will you choose to run out of the room? Will you try to block the door open to stop it from closing? 
Or will you allow the door to close, leaving you in the room? Okay, you can open your eyes. That's just kind of the basic core projective thing that the SPSSI does. It gets you to imagine something. You're projecting yourself onto this neutral stimuli of this scenario. And from that, you're asked to answer some questions. From those questions, we can draw out lots of information. Now, there's also lots of, I think there's some, something like 25 um, objective, operationally defined questions. But a lot of them are very projective. And from that, you're able to get a fairly good sense of where the person is, not only in the realm of uh, substance abuse, but on the whole scheme, kind of the normal curve of where a person would be as far as my life is meaningful, where they would be on that scale. Um, just want to kind of walk through very quickly. There's the validity for criterion-related validity, the reliability, uh, test, retest, reliability for the various scales. Uh, for the sake of time, I just want to stop with a little warning that I think it's important to use screening tools in counseling, but at the same time, we have to be careful that that does not become the emphasis of the session. Okay? The goal is the person's story, not our issues and where they fit on these scales. It's their story and their humanness and the choices that they are making. And as long as we remember that, things will go well. That's it for my presentation.